I am Gaurav Minali, currently a fourth year medical student at APZ Army Institute of Health Sciences. Thank you. Pinky. Hello everyone, I am Pinky Jha, currently a fourth year medical student from Nepalis Army Institute of Health Sciences. We're glad to have you all here. Mahindra. Hello everyone, my name is Mahindra. I'm a final year medical student at National Medical College. I'm a public relations officer at Dandy Club Nepal. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, we also have a few of our officers joining in, but I'd like the speakers without delay. Uh, so uh, Dr. Pant, it is an honor to have you here today because I think uh, every Nepalese person has heard anecdotes about him and he has been a huge inspiration for all medical students here in Nepal. And um, talking about uh, Dr. Panth, he's currently working as the chief neurosurgeon in Annapurna Neurological Institute and Allied Sciences here in Kathmandu, Nepal. And uh, he has his special interest in epilepsy surgery, in motor disorder surgery, as well as psychosurgery about deep brain stimulation and lesioning of the brain. And he has been working to raise the line for Nepal. Uh, we cannot explain the inspiration he has been for Nepalese neurosurgery. And it is such an honor to have you here, sir. We would like to hear a few words from you before we begin the session. Uh, Dr. Pant, you're muted. You have to unmute yourself, sir. There you go. Yeah, yeah. It's a big surprise for me that uh, the medical students on Saturday evening, rather than boozing out, you know, they are <laughs> here to listen to my lecture. It's a big surprise to me. So I hope I have done, done justice to the young peoples and uh, I look forward to any questions that arise at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank yeah, you for having me here. Tonight. Yeah, we have more than a hundred people in the panel, Doc. Okay, go ahead, Hermina. Where are we yeah. going from here? I think we can start with the session. I can, I think we should proceed. Okay, very good. Hello, everybody. Uh, this video is mainly uh, dedicated for um, last year medical students, interns, uh, house officers, and uh, maybe it will also be useful for residents uh, who want to uh understand brain tumor and that also mainly of high grade uh, glioma i'm basant pan from onapuna neurological institute so if you look at the incidence of tumor then uh, the breast cancer lung cancer last bowel prostate these are the uh, highest killer of uh, uh, tumor but uh, if you look at the brain and CNS uh, tumor, it occupies about 2% of the whole uh, tumor that uh, the human being can suffer from. And uh, if you look at the incidence, it's about 23 per 100,000 and the prevalence is about 48 per 100,000. And one third of that is high grade, two third of that is low grade. So low grade is uh, more commoner then high grade tumor. And uh, if you look at this uh, ACE distribution, then you can see that there is a small peak here in the, the younger ACE group, but as they progress, it decreases and then again it rises somewhere around, the peak is somewhere around 60s or you know, 50s, 60s. So, you know, most of the tumor in the world that occur somewhere around 50 to 60 zero. So that is also a period where you can have any kind of tumors and that is also uh, so with um, brain tumors and slightly male is more affected with glioma than females. So I just want to show you this picture where this gentleman was, you know, have had a very, very big brain tumor which invaded his skull, which eroded his skin, and he was actually using this as a pillow, you know. 
and he was sleeping on the tumor itself till uh, it started eroding and smelling and his wife left him then only he came to us for treatment so if people can die of tumor they can also live with it and um, so you know you, just to give you an example how extensive but benign a uh, tumor can be this is obviously a benign tumor and then we did a very very extensive removal of this tumor and then our main goal was to remove the tumor but also to bring his wife back but then unfortunately you know his wife never came back but then we could remove his tumor probably he found another wife or so anyway and um, another example of what, how extensively our tumor can be this young gentleman this is a post-op scan where you can see that you know whole of his back is full of tumor and this is a, a neuronoma it's not a glioma just to give you an example of how extensive tumor can be the doctor is you know holding the whole of the tumor that we have we have removed so most of the time we remove small chunks of tumor from the body but sometimes it can be so aggressive and we have to remove such a large amount of tumor so now coming back to my uh, main theme of presentation today so brain tumor a diverse group of neoplasm arising from different cells within the cns uh, uh, a systemic cancer uh, uh, or it can be metastasized from other part of the body and goes to the brain and it can be benign or malignant as with other tumors and um, if the origin of the tumor is glial tissue then we call it glioma it can be from any other tissue that is present in the brain but when it comes to origin of the glial tissue not the neurons then it's called a glial tumor and it is divided into low, two types, a low grade and a high grade. A low grade is a well differentiated, which is not anaplastic, and a high grade is undifferentiated and a very anaplastic malignant cells. And out of this, the glioblastoma multiformis, which is the main topic of the talk today, is the most aggressive form of the tumor out of all these tumors. So when we um, classify uh, brain tumor glioma into grade 1, grade 2, grade 3, grade 4, then glioblastoma multiformis comes into grade 4 tumor. So if you look at this picture, then you can see that um, glioblastoma multiformis, multiple forms, it has got a multiple forms, so it's called multiformis. So there is an astrocytic differentiation. You know that it is coming from, a, you know, the glial tissue, a neuronal uh, nuclear atypia is there, you know, mitosis can be seen. There is a necrosis because it's rapidly developing. So the vasculature cannot cope, cope with its growth. And uh, there is a microvascular proliferation, as you can see here, and pseudopalisading and necrosis. These are, you know, the hallmarks of glioblastoma multiformis. And uh, there's a lot of confusion about brain tumor. And uh, if there's a lot of confusion, then they try to make a lot of classification. So there has been a lot of classification that has been made on glioma till date. The first edition was, which came in 1979, then in 1993 as a blue book. And then the third edition, fourth edition, and then the fourth edition revised, which is the latest which is uh, which came in 2016 and these differences is mainly made by histology and lastly by uh, immunohistochemistry and also genetic study once we started doing genetic study then we started understanding that although histologically all look same but then genetically they are totally different and their prognosis their long-term survival rate was also totally different so that's why the latest revision of 2016 came up. So as I have just said, molecular and immunohistochemical testings, which includes mainly the change the scenario of glioblastoma multiformis is IDS, IDS1, mainly IDS1 mutation, whether there's a mutation or not. 
and also IDS2 mutation. If you have an IDS1 mutation, which means that they have got a good prognosis and good biomarkers, and uh, this can be done by immunohistochemistry. And uh, if there is a, you know, uh, IDS1 is a wild type, there is no mutation, then it has got a poor prognosis. And uh, also there is a 1P19Q codilation, which uh, is mainly seen in oligodendroglioma. So if astrocytoma is mixed up with the oligodendroglioma, then you can see this codilation. And if you see this codilation, then that tumor has got a good prognosis, although it's a glioblastoma multiformis. Uh, and uh, this can be done by these PCR and FIST techniques. And um, also another biomarkers is an uh, important biomarker. There are many, many biomarkers, but I've just quoted the most common ones, the ATRX gene mutations, and um, seen in 45% of anaplastic astrocytoma. And uh, it, it, if you see this, then it's a hallmark of this is an astrocytoma and nothing else. And if you see this, then again, there is a good prognosis on these tumors. So what is what causes brain tumor? Why people have brain tumor? Many patient comes to me and ask me, Doctor, what did I do wrong in my life that I have this? And uh, so it's basically till now we don't know the cause. So we have to say there is a multiple factors, maybe the genetic factors and maybe the progenetic factors, both environmental factors, both are involved. But um, some of the genetic factors which is well known are neurofibromatosis type 1, type 2 and uh, Turcot syndrome and uh, some other things. But one of the most identified and uh, cause is ionizing radiation, uh, which is a well-established risk factor. But uh, how much ionizing radi radiation naturally we are getting? Uh, besides, you know, atomic bomb or uh, nuclear explosions or, um, you know, accidents, we don't know. So, you know, uh, this is an environmental factor. Probably we have very little control till date. And uh, some inclusive like head injury, some food, occupational exposures, electromagnetic field like cellular telephone, like there was a very, very big when cellular telephone came. There was a big debate whether the cellular telephone is safe for human being or not, because most of the time you, you if you are right handed, you are carrying the telephone on your right hand. And um, so, you know, you are, um, you may be prone to right temporal lobe glioma. There was a lot of studies and uh, some studies said, yes, you after telephone, um, you know, use, you have more right temporal glioma has increased. But then there was another group of people said, no, there's not much of difference, but then still it can be a cause. So, you know, most of the time, if you can avoid putting the telephone on your ear itself and use an earphone, then that would be better. And some allergic immune phenomena like, you know, is, has got a, actually a protective uh, role like IgE, asthma, eczema, these are the people which seems to have with the control, which seems to have a little bit low incidence of uh, uh, glioma. So clinical features, they can present with any forms. Uh, it doesn't mean that they have got a set form of presentation. As you know, that um, brain is the only structure in the body which is which has got selective uh, task performance by selective part of the body. Like frontal lobe has its own work, temporal lobe has its own job, amygdala has its own job, hypothalamus has. So depending on where the tumor is arising, the symptom may vary from hearing loss to vision loss, to you know increase in appetite, decrease in appetite, and so on and so forth. And many times when patient to come to us and say, I have a headache, just simply headache or we just screen the patient for you know a usual test and then incidental tumor we have seen many many patients who has leveled as migraine for a long time and then we do a scan and then find that there's a brain tumor so incidental is is not uncommon so if you go and do a brain scan then you may have a small tumor then that you detect 
So recently our proposal is that anybody, any adults who is at the age of 50, they should have at least one scan of their brain, whether it's a CT scan or MRI in their lifetime. So, and then, but then the presentation can be that of increased intracranial pressure like headache, vomiting, uh, some kind of neurological deficit, depending on where it is, confusion, memory loss, you know, personality changes if it's mainly on the frontal lobe. Uh, about the seizure, there are many books which say that the first seizure should be, you know, you don't treat first seizure or you don't investigate first seizure. But um, my personal uh, strong um, teaching is that you must, must uh, study the first seizure because every seizure is first seizure in their life. So you may miss that chance of detecting a brain tumor or some, you know, nasty uh, brain pathology. So every seizure should be evaluated and if everything comes normal then first seizure you can just ignore and may not treat it but then yeah, that is that may be the time when you can get some very important information and uh, but the seizure activity do not uh, correlate with the tumor grain a tumor in the eloquent area like speech area, memory area, you know, they, they will have a very profound uh, deficit, profound neurological symptoms. If it's on the pituitary, you have pituitary symptoms. If it's in the visual cortex, you have visual symptoms, so on and so forth. So for investigations, uh, maybe to start with, we do a CT scan. Most of the time, this is the cheapest and most easily available. The only drawbacks is that it has got a radiation effect. So, you know, tend to avoid in children uh, unless it's really necessary. So if you are screening a people just for headache, then the probably MRI would be a better uh, solution than CT scan. And uh, so, uh, uh, the main thing that is said, but then the most important thing is, unless you do an enhanced uh, CT scan, like in this case, the lower picture, where you can see a fudgy, you know, looking, but then you don't know what's going on. But unless you enhance that picture, you don't know uh, whether it is actually some pathology or not. So just plain CT is not enough. So if you want to do, you have to do an enhanced CT scan. And uh, it will have, if, if it's a glioblastoma, high-grade glioma, then it will have a mixed density. Uh, somewhere it's a necrosis, somewhere it's a cellular pro proliferation. So the density will be mixed. If there's a calcification, then most of the time it says that it is um, a low growing, a low uh, tumor. So there can be a cystic component on the necrotic part. There may be some hemorrhage if, you know, the vascular proliferation cannot co op with uh, the tumor growth and um, so on and so forth. And uh, so the mar most of the time the margins are irregular and uh, there will be hypodense central and there will be a mass effect because there's uh, some new tissue that has grown. So you can see that it is shifting and you can see that it has grown and uh, caused a mass effect. So next investigation is that of MRI, which is the standard test where you will do a T1, T2 and flare at least and an enhanced uh, gadolinium enhanced MRI. Where again, unless you do a gadolinium enhanced MRI, you don't see how clearly the tumor is being enhanced and you don't, you know, you, you cannot delineate how much to remove uh, so on and so forth. So if it's a high-grade glioma, then you can again see an irregular margin, maybe central necrosis, uh, area of enhancement, area of non-enhancement. So heterogeneous type of presentation is there. And uh, MR spectroscopy is another test which uh, is routinely done these days. And uh, spectroscopy is actually the test which started MRI itself. So MR imaging started from MR spectroscopy, the chemistry used to use it. So here we study the chemistry of the brain uh, and the brain tissue. 
And uh, most of the time, if, you, if it's an elevated choline like this, very high choline and decreased acetyl aspartate in AA, then, um, uh, then it, is, it suggests that it is a high grade glioma. So you can put your voxel in different parts of the brain and see how much of uh, choline and uh, n acetyl aspartate and uh, creatinine and so on and so forth. So different chemical structures will give you whether it's a low grade glioma or a high grade glioma, you know. So this is a very good information, especially when you are confused with a tumor and infection. Most of the time, this will give you a very good picture of what you are dealing with. And uh, another test is uh, to look at the blood flow of the brain itself, which is called dynamic uh, susceptibility contrast MRI, where you can look at how much the blood perfusion is happening in, inside that tumor. And uh, most of the time it is a high grade glioma. There's a lot of metabolism going on. So there's a lot of blood flow uh, in that area. And then you can pick that up by a graphic. And there is a ratio that you can have cerebral blood volume uh, ratio. And that will give you, uh, you know, automated calculated values, which uh, can give you a hint about whether it's a glioma. Uh, low grade or high grade like these two are a high grade and low grade glioma's which has got a different balance here and uh, uh, to add on like this is one of our patients where you can see there's a glioma right sitting on the motor cortex and uh, now we want to know which part of our body um, uh, correspond to that and whether we uh, removing that par part of the tumor we are going to damage any structure or not so when you do a finger tapping test uh, with an MRI, which is called functional MRI, fMRI, hand tapping. So this is a hand area where you can see that the activation is more. It's again looking at the blood flow in that area. If you tap your hand, then that area of the brain will have more metabolism. So you can see it like this. And this is the leg area. So these are the parts which we have to avoid in order to remove this tumor so that we don't give deficit to the patient. So this is very, very important add on uh, test that we can do on a tumor patient. Uh, another test that we routinely do these days is called a diffuse tensor imaging DTI, which is which gives you a tactographic, you know, flow of the of fibers that connects from the brain to the spinal cord and to the periphery. So different tracts will have different colors, right and left, like green, uh, you know, anterior perto corticospinal tract will have blue and, uh, um, you know, front to back will have red and different colors can be designed, uh, designated to different tracts, depending on whether it's a right and left, whether it is front to back or whether it's up to down or down to up, something like that. And uh, like in this case, the previous case, same case, where you can see that these are the part that you want to avoid so that you don't give any motor deficit. The blue one is a corticospinal tract. Now, uh, SPECT and PET are two very important tests that you can add on to give you some examples of uh, how much, you know, uh, the metabolism that is happening in that part. And uh, sometimes to detect smaller tumors also it is helpful. And it will also give you some conclusion, some, some idea about how uh, uh, aggressive the tumor is. But uh, PET scan is not mandatory before doing uh, any brain tumor surgery. So it's, it's an add-on information that you can get. Now, before you go on to operate on somebody, then you need to know the language area and uh, the memory area when it comes to temporal lobectomy. So most of the time we have left side is the dominant side, but sometimes, you know, we can have a right-sided uh, dominance also like in this lady. So we inject a propofol or uh, 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 barbiturate, whatever you have, and then you inject it directly into the carotid artery and knock down one part of the brain. So they, they become paralyzed. So she, we injected on left side, she became paralyzed on right side. And then she will stop speaking if it's a, 
left side of the brain is controlling her, you know, um, uh, speech. And then we also ask for memory test. We show her some cards and then ask her what, what was the card that we showed her before we injected the propofol. So if she can properly answer, there are some scores. Then if she can answer, then we know that the memory, even if you remove that part of the uh, hippocampus amygdala, then, you know, the patient will not have any problem. So this is a called water test. So sometimes for language and memory, we do this water test as well. And uh, so now when it comes to a lesion where there's an extensive involvement of the insula, the temporal lobe, the frontal lobe, and the tumor has gone into the basal ganglion and into the internal capsule, then you need to have some kind of uh, study during surgery so that you know that you are not damaging the brain when you are operating on them. So in such cases, we use uh, uh, different techniques and um, most of the time we use a uh, motor evoke potential like this, which is implanted on the uh, skull itself. And then, you know, there are some signals that we pass, electrical signals that we pass through the skull and then we record it in the hand to see whether we are damaging the corticospinal tract or not. Or we can also test the uh, other pathway, which is a somatosensory pathway, and see that you know we are not damaging the sensory pathways. So this can be done. Neuro navigation. I will talk again. And cross cytology is something that you can do if you have a frozen section in your center. That's the best. But if you don't have frozen section, you can at least do a cross cytology. Ask your pathologist to give. Uh, the result when you are operating just to give you an example whether it's a high grade or a low grade so that you can tailor your surgery um, in time. Awake craniotomy which will I talk again uh, is something that you can add on and safe gross total excision is something that we all are practicing these days. So we don't want to give additional deficit to the patient so our removal will need to be within the safe margin but then we want to remove as much as possible. Why we need to do that, we'll tell you, I will tell you again. So this is a setup of a neuro navigation where you can, the patient can be navigated, their you know, MRI is recorded in the computer and their different parts of the body are you know, registered in the computer so that it matches with the MRI. So once, and then CT scan MRI can be fused, it's a fusion image. And then when you move your tools, surgical tools, then you can see where you are touching, you know, and you can actually navigate within the brain and then try not to damage the normal part of the brain itself. So this we routinely use in our setup. And uh, if it's a deep seated tumor, if it's a difficult deep seated tumor where navigation will not be correct enough, like in this case, which is pretty deep one, you don't want to miss it, then you can do a stereotactic targeting or do a biopsy, or you can just follow that tractography track and then remove. So this is a stereotactic frame where you target, you know, this, we wanted to remove the whole of the tumor. So we just, you know, um, uh, did a stereotactic uh, localization. And then after we localize, then we followed that pathway and remove the tumor or you can just do a small borehole and take out the tumor and do the biopsy. Uh, other uh, adjuvant uh, things that you can do is uh, uh, some dye called 5 ala fluorescent, which you can inject or other dyes. And then once you are operating, if you have a 5 ala filter in your microscope, then you can see that there is a blood brain barrier disruption and then that 5 ala uh, brights up and then it looks red. So the tumor root looks red. And then you can remove that red parts and then you know that you have done a complete resection. Um, the result with use of 5 ala and without 5 ala is controversial. And uh, 5 ala is very, very expensive. Uh, one injection cost about $1,500. But actually 5 ala is nothing but a fertilizer, you know. And um, it is a pump find find in the Alibaba in the, in KG you know?
you can buy it in kgs that's exactly the same chemical structure but then you know medical uh, people when they make it a medical uh, uh, drug then they charge so much that uh, most of the institute will have hesitation using it because of its cost factor and uh, you know using it doesn't mean that you know you are going to cure the patient it looks fancy but uh, the result is not that and um, again the awake craniotomy that i will talk uh, just now like um, in this patient the uh, there is a you know diffuse type of glioma in the left side of the brain in a, in a young lady so you can which involves the broca's area so it involves the wernicke's area so if you damage this then they will have a profound you know um, problem so what you can do in such cases is that our con uh, concern is preservation of the speech. So, so here what we do is we, uh, once we, it's called sleep awake sleep technique where you put the patient into sleep first. And then once you do a craniotomy, which is, which makes a lot of sound, you know, and then once you have reached the um, desired spot, then you wake the patient up and then you stimulate the part of the brain that you think is uh, our eloquent area. Like in this lady, we are, you know, we are concerned about the speech. So we are asking her to read the newspaper and then stimulate that part. If we touch the um, Broca's area, she will immediately stop speaking. And then we know that uh, we have damaged. Uh, this is the part that we need to avoid and we should not remove, you know. So, uh, to preserve the speech, we can do this, or you can do the same thing on motor area. When you stimulate, then they will have problem on uh, hand movement or leg movement. So you can do that. So with such techniques, you can remove a lot of tumor like this. And uh, six months follow up, she has got no deficit on speech and on memory, and. Uh, 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 a gross total excision of the tumor uh, can be achieved. For treatment of low-grade glioma, you know, complete surgical resection is curative uh, most of the time. Low-grade means grade 1 and grade 2, a WHO grade 1 and grade 2. So, and if you do a near total excision, you know, there is a chance of, you know, delayed uh, secondary malignant transformation is also avoided and uh, if there's a resection of the optic pathway or a hypothalamus deep midline structures you know maybe you can do a selective resection depending on where it is and so here is a gentleman where I operated on this child uh, when he was uh, six months old and last time he came to meet me when he was 22 years so you know, almost 22 years of follow-up, normal life, they have no deficit. So, you know, brain tumor doesn't mean that, you, you know, you, you, it's, the, your life is gone. If, if it's a low-grade glioma, then you will have, and you do a good job, then you can have absolutely a normal life. Uh, so there are many, many patients like this, but when it comes to a low-grade but diffuse glioma, like the previous one, where the margins are not very clear, then total resection may not be possible most of the time. So you may leave behind some of the tumors. And um, so you have to give some kind of adjuvant therapy, add on therapy like radiotherapy and chemotherapy, which I will discuss uh, in detail. So if it's a diffuse glioma, even if it's a low grade glioma, most of the time it's not curable and uh, you have to, you know, give uh, further treatment and further follow up. Uh, Sometimes you come across with it. This is a low-grade glioma, which uh, is very, very extensive, and uh, in the in the center of the brain, and which has which involves both sides of the brain. So in such cases, you know, sometime a very good, you know, thinking, and then uh, with the use of microscope and endoscope, like uh, when I did this surgery many years ago, I didn't have a neuroendoscope. So I borrowed a cystoscope from uh, the uh, ureteric colleagues, colleagues <coughs> and a laryngoscope from ENT colleagues, flexible scope. 
and then you know made just two burr holes and with microscope and endoscope from one side and then alternate you know uh, we could remove and then with some improvisation of the technique by ourselves like nasopharyngeal tube and endoscope is put like that we could suck out a whole of the tumor from just two burr holes so sometimes most of the time your target is to do a minimally invasive surgery so that you damage the brain as little as possible like this much of the brain can be removed from two burr holes only if you can plan accordingly but most of the time this is not possible like in this case like this young child has got you know extensive tumor on the skull base into the brain into the hypothalamus into the ventricles into the temporal lobe and to the ethmoid sinus and into the sphenoid sinus so in such cases you know you have to do an extensive uh, uh, resection uh, including the nose into the eyeballs and then remove whole of the tumor so uh, the purpose of showing these two things are depending on the case you may open small or if you need you may have to open extensively and remove as much tumor as possible this is the boy this is the pre-op that is the post-op and you know a little bit of scarring is there but he's a happy boy and uh, sometimes we face with uh, a problem like this this is not a meningioma this uh, this is not a glioma this is a meningioma on an 18 years girl who is six months pregnant you know and has got an enormously large tumor and uh, she, and uh, there's a lot of mass effect on her and uh, pregnancy uh, the hormones in pregnancy result in rapid growth of the tumor itself so some somehow you have to take it out but then she was six months pregnant so uh, we you know made a special table for her and then so that she is not kept in a prone position uh, her tummy was not pressed and then we approached her from the uh, back and then this is the lady afterward and with cesarean section she could have a normal child you know so uh, these are some of the challenges that you can you may have to face uh, doing uh, uh, brain tumor surgery at times. So these are some of the bad candidates of um, uh, glioma that may present to you. Uh, very large left-sided dominant hemisphere, uh, nasty looking most likely glioblastoma. And uh, this is a basal ganglia, right-sided but very deep, again a glioma. This is called a butterfly lesion, which is through the corpus callosum. It has gone into both sides. So the both of the hemisphere is involved or the brain stem is very, very badly involved. Or this is called a multicentric glioma where you can see satellite lesions away from the main tumor, you know. So these are nasty tumors that you may face. And the, you know, the result most of the time is very, very bad in these cases. So this is another case of a glioma where there is a diffuse brainstem glioma where you can see that there is no no worry where you can enter into the brainstem. Whole of the brainstem is diffusely involved. And I refused to operate on this child. And I said that, you know, radiotherapy would be the only options that he has. But somehow they landed up in another centers where they operated on her multiple times. And they spent a lot of money and uh, eventually the child died and the parents became very, very poor. So, you know, we have to be very honest with our patients. And if a case like this comes, there's a limit to what the science can do in a case like this. And we have to be a little bit blunt to them in the first instant and then tell them that this is an incurable. And this we must, we, we should learn to say that. Uh, these are some of the high grade deep-seated tumors that we actually operated although these are not very good cases but then uh, with the help of uh, neuronavigation stereotaxy you know these patients can also be operated some of the examples that I have given here 
and uh, this is a gentleman which has got a uh, glioma in the uh, brain stem which has exophyted it it has there's a there's a mouth that has opened into the fourth ventricle here so this is these are the cases that you can actually enter through the tumor and take it out like in this case this is the gentleman post op so there's no deficit and you can remove the tumor even if it's in the brain stem even if it's uh, like another case where it's a 10 years girl with a left-sided weakness of two by five. First we did, there's a lesion here, which is very, very deep into the thalamus. And uh, we did uh, a stereotactic biopsy first on this girl and found that this is a pilocytic astrocytoma. And uh, we said, we thought, oh, we must try to remove this tumor. So. Uh, because the pilocytic astrocytoma has got a very, very good long-term survival rate. So through the tract, we went into the tumor and then we could go and remove whole of the tumor in the skirt. And then, you know, six months follow-up scan, which shows that the whole of the tumor has been removed. This is the tract that we followed. And she has got a little bit of hemiparesis because we have crossed the uh, internal capsule to reach the other end of the tumor but then uh, you know she is a happy girl so and then this girl eventually her hemiparesis will come up because she's pretty young and then she will have a normal life so even if it's a deep-seated tumor if you think it's a low-grade glioma then you should attempt to remove it and uh, so treatment options of high-grade glioma uh, I would say that there are actually three options. One, if you think this is a really a very, very high grade glioma and you are sure by spectroscopy and other tests that it's a high grade, then you should give an option of do no treatment. Uh, I will explain to you why I am saying this because uh, uh, many a times you are just adding few months by doing different surgeries and different other techniques. So you must give them a, an option depending on where you are, you know, and most of the time in our country, the patients are paying out of their pocket and uh, you should not, you know, uh, make them poor and then, you know, eventually they will die. Another option would be just to take a biopsy by stereotaxy or neuronavigation and to, you know, give them a histological confirmation that you are dealing with a high grade glioma. All the thought is excision and do a biopsy and depending on the immunohistochemistry, the histology, whether to add on radiotherapy or chemotherapy. This is how we are. We give all these options to the patients before we go on. The Stroop protocols, which means that a maximum safe resections, uh, which is a, a kind of a cytoreductive surgery and um, the median survival will be about six months in glioblast or multiformis. If you add radiotherapy on that, then you may add another six months. So the median survival will be 12 months. And if you add chemotherapy, temozolomide is the drug that you usually use, then again, another two or three months that you are adding, you know. So uh, this is published in New England Journal of Medicine most of the time. Most of the institute are following this protocol. But then I still say that, you know, do no treatment could be one of the options. And you must tell the patient that this can also be an option for you. But having said that, glioblastoma multiformis recently have changed its picture because glioblastoma multiformis is a devil but the devil have got a bigger devil and a smaller devil. The bigger devil is a primary glioblastoma multiformis. Primary glioblastoma multiformis means it's a de novo uh, production of the tumor. Uh, it just became tumor from without anything. And 90% uh, of the time, that is what you are seeing. And it's seen in older age group. Uh, there is a genetic alternation and uh, EGFR is overexpressed. Uh, there's a PTN mutation and uh, IDS1 is a wild type, not a mutant type. So this is a bad case. So if you think, if you do a biopsy and get this, then you must tell that out of glioma also, uh, devil, this is a bad devil. And uh, there's another smaller devil, which is called a uh, secondary GBM. 
where there was a benign tumor for a long, long time, and then it transformed into a, a, a glioblastoma multiformis, which was a low, low grade. And then, you know, they, are, they tend to present a little bit earlier in life, and genetic alternation includes uh, IDS1 uh, mutant type and uh, other mutation like, you know, the I previously said, 19Q loss and TP53 mutations and so on and so forth. So you have to do a genetic study and an immunohistochemistry and define what exactly is the tumor now, whether it's a bad type or a good type. And then again, after surgery, if it's a really bad type of tumor, then you can tell them that whatever you have done, you have done. Now, uh, probably you don't need to go further for treatment or there are these options whether you can go for that, but probably that will add another six months of life. That's all. So another test that we have not been able to do, but which is a very, very good test is how much methylation there is, how much of methylation expression there is. And if you can do that test, and um, more methylation means more, uh, it's a better prognosis. And if you look at unmethylated and methylated, then there's almost like six months add on to their life, you know, if it's a methylated. So this is something that we can now add to our patient's uh, study and see whether it's a methylated or unmethylated uh, tumor. Uh, so again, coming back to if you do just biopsy, then probably the patient will, you know, die almost by nine months. If you do an extensive resection, maybe they will survive for one or one and a half month, a year. And, um, you know, with radiotherapy, with chemotherapy, you in, add on few months in their life. So there is a paper in GNS on 1990 where they took a tumor specimen two centimeter away from the margin of uh, enhanced uh, CT scan. And they inoculated that part, the normal brain, which is two centimeter away from the tumor and inoculated that into a new mouse, which is an immunosuppressed mouse. And also they also grew, grew it and then look at the motility of the glial tissue. Glial tissue have a motility, and if it's a tumor, it moves more. So in, in both instances, they saw that the new mass grew, grew tumor, and the motility was also high. So they concluded that you have to remove at least two centimeter more if you want to do a gross total resection. And then another study was done that was four centimeter away from the uh, area. And then uh, this was on 1997. And uh, then uh, again, they saw the similar finding. So the conclusion of glioblastoma multiformis is that it is the disease of the whole brain. It is not only a localized enhanced area in the MRI or high density area, high intensity area in the flare, but much more larger than that. So most of the time, the most limiting factor is this, that glioma is the disease of the whole part of the brain. And sometimes you have a tumor in this side, the opposite brain also have the tumor like you saw in the butterfly lesions. So glioma uh, survival, you know, so it only depends on what is the grade of the tumor. If it's a grade two tumors, their, their survival is pretty good. Grade one has got absolutely, you know, they've become cured. But then as you go on to the grade, then your survival rate becomes less. And if you just do a radiotherapy, the survival rate is, the mean survival rate is about 18 months. But if you add timozolamide, probably you add few more months. So this is uh, the malignant brain tumors, uh, overall malignant brain tumors of different uh, diseases like oligodendroglioma, ependymoma, and blah, 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 different tumors. And uh, some tumors has become very good in survival, you know, uh, like anaplastic astrocytoma, it is getting better. But if you look at glioblastoma, you know, the, the survival rate of glioblastoma has not changed much over the many, many years. So this is another paper which said that 
you know, the operative skill and operative technique of the doctor has improved so much that the mortality and morbidity immediately after surgery has improved dramatically. And for low-grade glioma, the result is has become very, very good. But when it comes to a high-grade glioma, then the perioperative mortality mortality has gone down. But nevertheless, the overall prognosis of the patient of glioma has not changed since 1970s. So we are almost 50 years there has not been a substantial change in the overall survival of a glioblastoma multiformis patient. And this is an area where new treatments, new uh, you know, modalities of research is going on. And we should also know that when we offer different type of treatment to glioblastoma multiformis patients, we should remember this paper where it says that cancer, overall the cancer treatment in America are taking of 42.4% of the entire life asset is being used up on cancer treatment in most of the patient. So this, uh, this paper from Oklahoma University is a very, very important paper for me because we do not, we should not make them poor. We, just because the technology is available doesn't mean that it is suitable for everybody. So we must have a proper informed consent about this. Now, some you know latest uh, technology that is going on, ongoing trial therapies like uh, 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 glidel uh, tablets that can be used in uh, the tumor bed after you remove, and this is being used in many countries right now, and which has again added on another you know three months of survival. And another is uh, electrical current that you pass in the brain and then you know you wear it like this uh, overnight for many many days about three weeks and um, the idea is that uh, the current will stop mitosis because for mitosis there is a fibril uh, uh, you disrupt the uh, mitotic pathway the movement of the uh, chromosome and uh, then you stop mitosis that is the idea here and this technique is very simple. Maybe you can use it for recurrent tumors or things like that. And it has added about three months and there, there's no harm on this and pretty cheap technique. And gene therapy or immunotherapy are some of the things. Like in gene therapy, what you do is, you know, you get a, a virus vector and then you inoculate it, uh, some kind of enzyme producing uh, in the uh, virus spectra and inject that into the brain and uh, their survival rate has increased uh, by again a few months in these cases. And um, uh, immunotherapy is uh, like you know most of the time many of these patients are immunocompromised or they, they you, you activate their own immune system to fight against the tumor because as you know tumor is being we are fighting with the tumor all the time and uh, we have tumor de novo tumor formation in our body all the time and our immune system is fighting day in day out you know so just to boost that and then you know try to increase your own immunity so some kind of vaccines and this has also shown a very promising result but not you know such a big leap has been achieved uh, the study that we are doing in our institute is um, uh, some plants that we use uh, for cancer therapy. We are using HeLa cell, brain tumor cells, and uh, other breast cancer cells. And these are the orchids that we use. And uh, uh, we have tested 11 plants. And, uh, and there is a very, very promising result that we have seen in these cases. And... Uh, so, you know, these are different plants that you have used and in different concentration, the wild type and the tissue grown type, tissue culture grown type, both have shown that these are very good cytotoxic uh, values. So all of us, you know, should also look at the things that is available uh, around us and see what we can do to help our patients. These are the papers that uh, our institute has published uh, about the, you know, the use of plants on uh, brain tumor 
and uh, now we are ready at least uh, two plants that we are ready to uh, you know launch as a you know add on uh, medicine for those who where everything is exhausted the patient have nothing to do now then we want to you know just give them so that they they will have few more months of palliative treatments so in conclusion uh, the first thing that uh, I think is that uh, all of us, all the countries in the world should have a national cancer registry so that we exactly know how much of the brain tumor are being identified because the picture that I showed in the early beginning is that, the, you know, after more CT, more MRI are being done, more and more of brain tumors are being detected. So. Uh, the, if you keep a proper registry in the whole country, then probably the number of brain tumors uh, will rise. And uh, we should always operate on benign tumors. There was a time when benign tumors were not being operated, they were just being followed up and you operate on uh, glioblastoma where the result is not good. But then because of you know good skill, good armament of surgery, you can safely resect most of the benign tumors and cure them. So you must treat all benign tumors. Surgery for high-grade glioma depends on totally on you know, informed consent that you take with the family members. And if they think that you know they want to take, even if it's a high-grade glioma, they want to give the whatever is available to the patient, then you can go ahead and do the surgery. And we need to individualize brain tumor management so that it becomes more cost effective. And uh, we need to learn to say no, this is now it's okay. Like sometime I operate on a glioblast or multiformis, they recall and they come back to me and say, okay, we want uh, another six months of life or three months of life. So please operate. Then most of the time I say, no, I don't want to operate anymore. It's not good. And uh, so we need also to call incorporate alternative forms of medical treatment in such cases you know? so this is the last slide that i have thank you very much for being with me so you know life is 10 percent what happens and 90 percent what you make out of it so what happens is what is the uh, tumor that we have if it's a glioblast or multiformis then uh, you know we are done with but then there is 90% still uh, space that we need to work on to get a good outcome in glioblast or multiparmis or a high grade glioma. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. That was an amazing lecture. Can I have some words? Can you repeat, please? Can I have some words? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, is there Bhaktam, Dr. Basantabant available? Hello? Yes, Herminia, how do you want to work it? Uh, are you taking questions now or what do you want to do, Herminia? Uh, I think uh, we should start with the Q&A session. Um, I see a first question in the chat uh, from- uh, Okay, we, we have someone asking a question on screen now. Uh, you want to answer that question? Uh, I guess you're asking if Dr. Rant's available, correct? Okay, Dr. Brandt, are you here? Is Dr. Brandt here or did he leave? Uh, I don't know. Dr. Brandt, are you there? Dr. Pant. Uh, I guess he, uh, I guess he might, may have fell off. Let me check to see if he's trying to get back in. Uh, yes, he's there. He's there. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. I think okay. someone has a question for you. Go ahead. There was a question. How much time would it take for the hemiparesis to disappear in a young female patient? That's the question? Yeah, well, that's one of the questions. You can start with that. Yeah. So 
if it's a young patient and if it is a hemiparesis only, then most of the time, three months is the period when they get better, you know. But if it's a complete paralysis, then they may not get better uh, even for a year or so. But if it's a partial hemiparesis, then most of the time they get better in three months. Okay. okay. Uh, are there any more questions you see, Doc, in the chat? Um, there is one in the chat from uh, Prajal, I think. Uh, mobile phones uses radio waves, which cannot cause any deterministic as well as stochastic effect like that of the ionizing radiation. So it might not be a risk factor, right? Well, there has been a lot of research, a lot of discussion about this topic, and uh, no, nobody has come into any conclusion till date. So I cannot say that mobile phone causes uh, brain tumor. Uh, uh, this is not for me, but then, you know, there is a, a high speculation that uh, uh, there is a possibility that uh, use of a prolonged mobile telephone can cause a temporal lobe tumor, mainly on the right side. And uh, there are many, many papers which Exactly. Uh, support that idea. And there was uh, some uh, a prospective study done on this uh, topic, uh, but the prospective study didn't show any, uh, you know, between the users, uh, mobile phone users and mobile phone non-users, there was no statistical uh, difference. So, you know, it's, it's not concluded, but then uh, uh, they say that uh, if the mobile phone is low powered mobile phone, then uh, it emits more power, you know, and uh, maybe the risk is more, but um, it's not very conclusive. But uh, I think it's better to be careful and uh, maybe not use, uh, maybe use the air phone is a better way. Okay. Okay. Who many of you see any other questions in the chat? Oh, uh, yeah. Hello, Shad. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hello, Shad. Namaste. Uh, greetings from Birgan, sir. Yes. Hello. Sir, I have been very much thankful to you uh, because you operated my mom back in the month of June and she's getting all fine now. Okay. Thank you very good, much. Good, good news. Sir, I have always been following you after that all. And the today's, uh, today's patient, uh, presentation was excellent, sir. I'm myself a medical student from Nepal Medical College studying in second year. Good. Very good. Good luck. Okay, do we have any more questions there, Herminia? Yeah, thank you, uh, sir, for such a wonderful. Yes, yes, I, there is one more much. question. Um, I read a recent article in Journal of Neuro-Oncology that stated significant, uh, significant uh, superiority of lobectomy over GTR for non-elocant gliomas. What are your views on this? And do we practice lobectomy in Nepal too? Yes, uh, we are doing lobectomy all the time. And uh, so, if it is a right-sided tumor, then we remove about six centimeters of the brain together with the amygdala and the hippocampus. And uh, because uh, most of the time the dominant hemisphere is on the left side. And um, if you are in doubt, then you can do a water test as I told you in the lecture and determine which side is the language area and which side is the memory. And uh, if it's uh, not the dominant side, then you can take out six centimeter of the brain. Uh, so more is better in glioblastoma. You know, you try to remove more, safe maximum removal. Uh, so lobectomy is uh, done and uh, occipital lobectomy we do, uh, frontal lobectomy we do, of course, uh, in glioblastoma, we are doing this all the time, yes. Okay, there are any more questions? 
Ah, uh, what is the role of cyber knife surgery in uh, glioblastomas? Uh, that's a very good question, you know. Uh, cyber knife, uh, gamma knife, these are a precise beam of radioactive substances that you, you know, put into the brain. It's actually, they call it knife, but then you don't use a knife. So you don't open the brain. So there's no knife here, you know, but then it's a misnomer. Uh, but um, it's so precise, the, the, the resection, the targeting of the tumor is so precise that they call it cyber knife, gamma knife. Cyber knife is you also take in consideration of movement of the brain. Uh, or movement of the chest or movement of the abdomen. So if you, if you consider the movement also, then you call it cyber knife. If you don't consider movement, then you call it gamma knife. So for GBM, as I have told you, that uh, the, if you look at the MRI, enhanced MRI, then two centimeter, four centimeter away from the tumor, you still have tumorous tissue there. So even if you remove four centimeter away from the tumor, you still have tumor left. So they call glioblastoma multiformis a tumor of the whole brain. So precise, anatomically precise, localized gamma knife, cyber knife is not a way to treat radiologically, uh, you know, uh, for uh, um, glioblastoma multiformis. So once we do a surgery, most of the time, is a whole brain radiation that is done. So there is no, you know, computer simulation, but it's a whole brain radiation that is better than uh, the old technique is better in, in these cases because the tumor is on the whole of the brain. Yeah, I have a question, Thank Doc, uh, about, yes. the, about high grade multi glioblastoma uh, multiform. Do you think the possibilities of lowering the rate? Uh, of mortality with high-grade uh, glioblastoma lies in studies uh, in China and utilizing artificial intelligence in large amounts of people. Do you think the future is in research in China? Um, <laughs> the, the research is always the, in China these days, you know, whatever is coming up is coming from China. So you talked about AI, you know, and, um, uh, and uh, which is feeding the information to the surgeon, how they should proceed with a special uh, typical uh, tumor. And I think there's a tremendous amount of future in that because uh, the computer will have all the previous information, uh, previous surgeries that has been done, previous histologies, previous, uh, radiations and recovery rate. So it will give you, um, you know, prognostic, how much the prognosis an individual patient can have. So I think artificial intelligence, especially on past events, the recording of a past event, which will give you an idea of what you should do today. You know, this kind of artificial intelligence is going to be a very, very helpful in the future. Okay, thank you. Okay, I see two more questions. First, uh, is go there for it, Arminia. Go crazy. Uh, is there a diet for the patient uh, with in uh, HGG? Uh, no, I don't think there is any dietic restriction or dietic uh, preference uh, which will reduce the occurrence or um, you know, uh, for glioblastoma uh, as such. But then, you know, we uh, allopathic doctors are very, very poor in the information on diet. And we must accept that because um, uh, the homeopathic people, they know a lot of things about diet, but we know very little. So we say, you know, don't eat too much fat, don't eat too much curry or don't uh, eat too much spicy things. That's all. We we just talk the same thing all the time. But when it comes to a molecular level dietic information, we are very poor. 
So my answer is uh, may not be hundred uh, percent, but then uh, there is no known dietic restriction on uh, glioblastoma multiformis. Although there are some dietic restriction on other neurological diseases, but not on um, uh, high grade glioblastoma. And I see that there are uh, other questions. So depending on oh, yes. uh, what factor will the consultant predict the survival time of the patient and how much will be the approximate accuracy? <laughs> this is a best question for me. I have told many patients that uh, you will not survive six months. Mm -hmm. And that patient will come after one year and shake my hand. So I have stopped predicting people's life. And it is not for me, I cannot predict. It is, it, it is a science that we predict on thousands of peoples. It is not, we don't in practice individualized medicine. So we cannot say how, this particular person is going to leave, how much he's going to leave or when he's going to die. I have stopped saying this because I have been ashamed by people coming back to me and shaking my hand uh, to the people that I've said, you are going to die in six months. So I've stopped saying that. And sometimes, you know, everything looks so nasty. We think that this uh, glioblastoma multiformis is a very bad tumor but we operate and it turns out to be something else and the patient has survived for a long, long time. So miracles happen. So I don't think you know, uh, we can say uh, exactly how long a patient is going to survive. But I, as I've told you in my uh, lecture, out of glioblastoma multiformis, if it's a wild type glioblastoma multiformis by uh, IDH1 uh, you know, wild type, and um, then the, and other immuno uh, expressions are bad, then these are the peoples which are not going to do good. And these are the people which will not survive. And most of the time when the people are elderly, 60s, 70s, and these are the people who are not going to survive for a long time. But then I would not, I, I have stopped saying that you are going to survive six months, nine months. I've stopped that saying that, I don't know. Okay, and uh, could you please elaborate on these uh, cytotoxic plants found in Nepal? Has this been a recent event or has been used for before as well? So this is, uh, um, uh, fortunately, my wife is, uh, uh, you know, uh, biotechnologist and she is an expert of botany and we have been working for a long, long time together. We did PhD together in Japan and um, this uh, we have been working on different orchids uh, and uh, coup culture the orchids together with uh, our brain tumor <laughs> and uh, we have found uh, at least four uh, orchids wild orchids, which has got a very, very strong cytotoxic uh, elements, but then it is not damaging the normal tissue. Uh, we have not done uh, animal experiment. It's uh, all in vitro experiments. And uh, this has been published in different peer reviews papers. So, you know, uh, we want to promote these um, uh, plants for people who have got nothing to be you know, most of the time we doctors say, okay, we have given you radiotherapy, we have operated on you, we have given you cytotoxic drug. Now there's nothing we can do. Then the patient becomes suddenly hopeless. So just to give them some kind of hope to hang on, you know, we want to use these plants so that, you know, and this is being very much commonly used in Switzerland as a tea and uh, in different other European countries and we want to do the same. And, uh, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't claim that it's going to cure brain tumors, but maybe it can add a few more months in their life or reasonable life in their life, uh, you know. So that is our idea, yeah. Uh, and uh, if there is a, any role of cannabinoids in treatment of gliomas? <laughs> Well, 
you should tell me about that. <laughs> Could be cannabis is uh, being used in everything. Epilepsy is and neuromodulation a lot of times. So, you know, who knows? I don't know. I'm not an expert on that. Uh, but uh, Nepal is a place where you have, you know, good cannabis. So you can do, somebody can do that study. And there is a question about robotic surgery has been a pioneer in resection of tumor in prostatic cancer and has shown good prognosis. What about the role in neurosurgery, what level or procedure? <laughs> well, um, uh, the problem with the glioblastoma multifurb is the topic that I got, you know, out of grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four, Glioblastoma multiformis is grade four and the worst type of brain tumors, you know. So in here, the precision of surgery is not that important, you know. And, um, but then a robotic surgery has got roles when you want to do a very, very fine surgeries. We have robotic surgery being used in uh, many, you know, bypass surgeries, anastomosis in the brain, uh, things like that. But, um, uh, and, stereotactically implanting different devices in the brain, uh, especially in epilepsy surgery. But for glioblastoma, it's the brain, uh, disease of the whole brain, you know, and then we, you don't need that millimeter sort of precision in. So I don't think there will be any role of uh, robotic surgery in glioblastoma. There are any more questions? Um, I don't see any more questions. Oh. <clears throat> uh, how do you deal and counsel <coughs> patients who present with brain tumors with less survival time? Yeah, this is a very important question. You know, this is the most important question that we always ask ourselves because um, we have technology which we use to extend their life for a few months, but we cannot cure them. And we must be honest with our patient and tell this fact to them. So I, in my slide, I have told you that my first option, if I think that this is a glioblast or multiformis, and most of the time in our country, the patient pay from out of their pocket, you know, and a lot of money they have to spend. And even in America, I showed you that 42% of their life, lifetime asset they use up in cancer management. So we must be honest and say that I think the patient have glioblastoma multiformis. If we operate on them, maybe we add few months in their life the quality of life, how it becomes is a question because if the surgery doesn't go very well, they may have deficit after surgery. So we have to tell this very, very honestly. But uh, most of the time, practically what I see is patients say, okay, I know what you are telling, but my patient, I want to give my family member the best that is available. So please do surgery if there is a possibility. Even if it's very small, I want to try. I want to give that chance to my family member. So most of the time we, we are stuck with this. But there are some people who will, will say, okay, doctor, if you think that the, you know, my family member is not going to make it, then let it go. So honesty uh, of uh, the practicing uh, doctor is very, very important in a time like this. Okay. Um, someone is asking if gliosarcoma is also a type of glioblastoma. No, uh, gliosarcoma is a different uh, entity and it is, it's a worse tumor than glioblastoma. And it's, it has got a sarcomatous um, entity in it, and it has got uh, uh, worse prognosis. Okay, and uh, Da Vinci robotic surgery is on trial in neurosurgery. 
although yeah. it has been used in urosurgery. Yeah, Da Vinci, a similar type of uh, surgery I just told you is being used mainly for uh, very fine anastomosis uh, because uh, your, your hand, how good your hand is, it's, it's still shaking. So uh, that is omitted in robotic, you know. So if you do a very, very fine suturing, like 10, 10 0, 11, 0 suturing of the brain, uh, which is uh, about uh, one fourth of a hair, it's so thin, you know. So uh, Da Vinci or similar side type of robotics are used in fine suturing where you can omit tremors. And when you want to go precisely, like stereotactically, you want to implant 10 implants into the brain, if you do it stereotactically in a conventional way, then it will take a long, long time. Calculate each X, Y, Z, and then put the you know probes in each target. It takes a long time. But when you do it with um, robots, then they are doing it you know just like this. So it's very, very fast. So epilepsy surgery, anastomosis, and very fine, precise surgery, uh, it is pretty good. But, um, uh, you know, it has got a lot of limitation, I would say. And uh, it's nowhere near replacing a human being. You know, you, I still want my head to be opened by a doctor, not by a doctor. You know, doctor, you mentioned something which I, I'd like to comment on. And it's actually part of the mission of neurosurgical TV is to examine the interface of other sciences with neurosurgery, things like robotics, stem cell, uh, artificial intelligence. And this particular platform of, of the Zoom, uh, I think is, is valuable for a work a place for a neurosurgeon because not necessarily, edu this is education, but for a neurosurgeon to get together with engineers and other people on the panel, you can have a good working session, I think, uh, with the new th new things that are happening, not just other neurosurgeons or other students, but with engineers, et cetera. Yeah. Absolutely correct, absolutely. You know, uh, I have three engineers in my uh, department and um, the navigation system that I showed uh, today is designed by our own engineer and then it's made in India. And um, uh, this is uh, used from um, uh, this uh, video game. Uh, we copied our video game software and then used it. And our engineer is doing a lot of work on artificial intelligence, especially on uh, eye tracking for paralyzed patients. And we do a lot of 3D printing, a lot of things. Today, I didn't talk about it. Maybe next time I can talk a lot about this thing. That would be great. We have a 3D yeah, we have a 3D printer, a very, very simple 3D printer, and we print our own, you know, skulls in, a, in our own lab, and then which is very, very cheap. And uh, with metal, metal acrylate, we, uh, we make our own bone cements and then implant it in our patients. And uh, we, don't, we don't have to ask the patient to pay a lot of money. So, uh, Working with um, different faculties of um, uh, biomedical engineers and um, robotic peoples, uh, there's a lot of potentials uh, of um, working together. And as uh, I told you about artificial in intelligence, which you asked, you know, you know, we we don't remember all the all the surgeries that we have done. But if we pull down all the informations of the surgery that has been done by many many peoples in one spot and then give an answer from that, then you will have a fantastic answer. And that is where artificial intelligence can give you a fantastic you know, guidelines of how to proceed with one individual patients. So there's a lot we can do with um, uh, computer, computer engineering and uh, uh, you know, biomedical engineering, artificial intelligence, and, um, uh, and we should work together in the same departments in the same operation theater. Most of the time, the 
the computer people are working in the computer and the neurosurgeons are working in the operation theater. They don't come together. Right. You should have beer exactly. together. You know? Exactly. You should use exactly. out together. And this and platform then, you know, lets it happen. Yes. This platform yes. lets it happen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, and, and we look forward to hearing you, really. That would, uh, that would be a great webcast for you to talk okay. about how you're incorporating the new sciences into neurosurgery, essentially. Yeah. I'll just give you an one one last example of uh, how we innovated, re-innovation, I call it. So there is a particle called PBA, polyvinyl acetic acid, which we use to inject on brain tumors before going for surgery. And uh, PBA particle was being sold by a company and which was not FDA approved at that time. So they, it was like a black market, you know, it was like, uh, buying a marijuana, you know, mm -hmm. and then you have to buy every every piece of it uh, in three hundred dollars, and then inject it. And um, I was surprised why PBA is so expensive. So I did some research on that, and found that PBA, the molecular structure, I studied, and found that it is nothing but a um, uh, uh, spoons that you use to mop the floor. And which is which you can buy one dollar a sheet, and that was when I was a resident in Japan, you know, and uh, I bought the sheet and then scrape it on um, some kind of scraper, and then filtered it with with some kind of mesh, and then started injecting on human beings. That was in Japan, and um, then everybody started doing that. And uh, one sheet lasted for one year, and we, it was one dollar, you know. Wow. So there is a lot of this kind of, I, I will call it not innovation, but re-innovation, you know. You kind of, you know, going around the innovation that has already been done in the West, and then, you know, re-innovate things so that you can provide it. So we have been doing a lot of similar things in our country. Uh, in my departments, and I can share that idea with you anytime. You know, oh, that would be that would uh, be, be fantastic. Uh, Anybody else have you. a comment? Right. Sorry, Hermina, uh, I'm taking your job. Are, <laughs> <laughs> are some questions? Uh, does a patient need to take liver? Terastam till last day of survival after surgical resection of brain tumor, especially GBM? Yes. So libiteracetam or any anti-epileptic drug, if you if you have a seizure and you are taking it, I recommend it to be taken for two years. The patient should be seizure-free, the patient should be aura free. No aura, no seizure for two years, they can stop it any anti-epileptic drug, libetacetam or any other drug. But if the patient had no seizure in presentation, but the patient doctor just gave it uh, for a profile access, then I would say they should only take it for nine months and then they can stop it. So this is our protocol. And uh, follow-up is uh, first we do a three months follow-up, then we do a six months follow-up. And after that, we do an annual follow-up and then we do a two years follow up. So depending on you know how the recurrence rate is coming, um, three months, six months, one year, and every two years. But uh, this can depend, uh, differ, may differ from country to country, but this is how we are practicing here. Okay. Uh, I have heard that COC yeah, yeah. protocol would be much beneficial in case of cancer included GBM, which includes drugs like metformin, mebendazole, doxycycline, and atorvastatin. Is it true? Uh, I have no idea about this. I cannot comment on this. Uh, if I could get any idea regarding time interval for review MRI scan after completion of radiotherapy for a case of GBM? Excuse me, I gotta mute somebody. Can you repeat the question? Uh, if I could get any idea regarding time interval, 
for review MRI scan after completion of radiotherapy for a case of GBM. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I accidentally muted him. I'm sorry. Um, can you repeat, please? Yeah, hold, yeah, let me try to get him. I don't think he realizes it. that was a faux pas. <clears throat> can you unmute? Uh, I can't even find his name to unmute. Uh, could you unmute, unmute, oh, oh yeah, punt, okay, punt. Be, okay, just hold on. Okay, I got it. Okay, yeah, unmute, okay. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that, my mistake. Yeah. <clears throat> so did you usually use five ally in glioma surgeon in case of total removal? So I, as I've told you, um, we are not using it that much. And uh, unfortunately, again, coming back to my re-innovation, uh, I told this in the, my lecture also, five ALA is very, very expensive. Five ALA cost $1,500 uh, for one injection. And most of the time, the patient cannot afford, number one. And number two, even if you use a five ALA, it will work on blood vein barrier. So the pink that you see under the microscope that you remove, but still the, the brain, as I have said, two centimeter, four centimeter away from the margin of the tumor, they still have tumor there, you know. So five ala may not be that helpful, but having said that, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a good tool that you can use. And uh, this is a fertilizer. Five ala is nothing but a fertilizer. And they sell it in Alibaba in cages, in tons. But when it comes to medical uh, injections, then it is $1,500 for one gram. So I don't know why it becomes suddenly so expensive. So there, there were people who were using this 5 ala from Alibaba as a tablet uh, before surgery. And uh, the one that we use is uh, by injection. Okay, see any other questions? <clears throat> or comments? Oh, I was okay. on mute, <laughs> sorry. Okay. I thought okay. the COC protocol is indicated in colorectal cancers. I don't know if uh, you can comment on that one and being a, not being a GI guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't see any more questions. Okay. Very good. Okay, Doc. Uh, we definitely have to stay in touch, and I'm look. I myself am looking forward to that. Uh, what the way you're interacting with other sciences uh, over there, and uh, yeah, it was wonderful talking with you all, young guys, and uh, you know, maybe a future neuroscientist. I can see here a lot of future neuroscientists and uh, maybe I can talk with you in the future as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, okay, thank thank you so much, uh, Professor. Thanks for arranging it, Prathana and Hermina. Thanks for the help. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so much.